Thank you for joining us for this video from Grow and Give, a modern victory garden project. Grow and Give will help you learn to grow food, share the harvest, and keep it local. The following video is taken from an excerpt from a live webinar on protecting the garden from animals. In this short video, Carol Amira from Boulder County Extension will teach you about protecting your garden from rabbits, mice, and voles. Um, I've done a lot of lawn checks over a few, you know, number of years, and uh, if I were to talk about the number one problem, pest, that we have from animals um, on landscapes uh, up and down the front range, it's going to be rabbits. They're cute. Um, you know, I like Peter Cottontail. They're really adorable, but they um, settle in places where there are no predators, and like I mentioned, you know, my whole area is like that now. Um, and they, um, they can do a lot of damage, both to the turf grass, to trees, to shrubs, to plantings. They're just, you know, are, you know, they're just trying to eat to survive, but they settle, they, they, you know, raise families, and it just gets to be out of control. They are active year-round, so they're not hibernating in the winter. Um, the damage that we see from them is really going to be on a lot of the tender young shoots on trees and in emerging um, ornamentals or in some of our vegetable plantings. But we'll also see damage higher up on the trees from their feeding that happened in the winter. So if deer are active at night and rabbits are active at night, you know, you'll see deer during the daytime, but they also feed at night. Um, how can you tell? How can you tell what kind of a pest you have? And it's, um, take a look at the damage that they've done. Deer lack the upper incisors, so um, they bite down in a really ragged, tearing way. And they will typically tear the bark off the um, tree branch that they're nipping at and it will be just a ragged torn edge. Rabbits have incredibly sharp teeth and they bite down and it leaves a very clean cut at a distinct 45 degree angle. If you see that kind of damage, that is going to be rabbit. And you could also take a look at what kind of droppings are left in the area. One of the things that I see in on lawn checks is I'll see the round droppings of rabbits. Um, deer have a more oval dropping. So what can we do to deter the rabbits? Well, if you have a dog, this is time for you to sit them down and discuss with them what their role is in the household. Sure, it's to give you companionship, but also they have a nobler cause of protecting their property. So a discussion of, you know, making sure they do their perimeter checks, uh, making sure they mark their territory with urine so that there's that predator odor there. Um, and also, you know, barking perhaps. Um, you don't want to have an animal that is prone to necessarily chasing or trying to uh, confront, uh, you know, some of the animals that come to visit, especially if it's deer, because that can be a real problem because deer will defend themselves. Or rabbits too, maybe chasing them off a little bit. But um, if you don't have a dog or your dog is um, under the impression that their role is something else in your house, you could use mirrors. Um, mirrors, especially those that are convex so that they really intensify the size of what they're reflecting, can be useful to put in areas um, where the rabbits might be. And if they come up on it and they see a much larger rabbit, they leave. Snake decoys are um, useful. Now, a snake decoy can be as simple as taking a hose and laying it down in a serpentine um, shape. Or you could get a children's toy like this one and lay that out there. Um, I find this incredibly effective for me personally um, because just at a glance, I always think it is a snake, but it's useful for the rabbits too. Um, however, you do have to move it around a little bit maybe not at the rabbit, but change where it is um, during the day. And you could also try scent-based um, repellents um, based on human hair. Um, you could spread that around, or you could use a, you know, a hot pepper-based spray to spray onto plants, again, not for um, 
plants that are for human consumption. Um, so these repellents are made to taste to make the plant unpalatable. And so that's why I'm saying don't put it on plants that you intend to eat. But um, yeah, that that um, shake, that, that dry product that I talked about for um, the rabbits is useful around this. There's also another, uh, there's a fertilizer, it's called melorganite. And this is a product that's made out of um, material that is used to um, uh, biodegrade uh, human waste. And so it's from the uh, city of Milwaukee. They bag it up, they sell it as a fertilizer. It's inert, so it doesn't have, you know, some bad contaminants, but it does have a very underlying odor of human waste to it that we can't smell, but because the bunnies have their nose right down in it, they can smell it. And it's useful as one tool in your toolbox for keeping rabbits out of an area. But I do wanna say overall, no one thing is gonna work. You've gotta try everything, um, often in combination. If you were to ask our, um, our uh, wildlife masters what to do about rabbits, this is what they would talk to you about. And it has to do with habitat modification. If rabbits feel really safe in your yard and they have a lot of cover, available cover, so decks to run under, sheds to run under, if they've got low-lying shrubs like junipers to run under, um, they're gonna hang out because they take cover. You can't get to them in there. Maybe their predators can't get to them in there. They're gonna hang out. So it is all about modifying the habitat so it is not uh, conducive to having them hang out. This does mean removing low-lying shrubs, fencing off under decks and sheds, getting rid of your brush pile or your wood pile. And one of the more challenging ones is a lot of people do dry stack um, rock walls um, as an ornamental, but they get in there, they can go through some of the you know little gaps in the rocks and they build a den in there. And that's really, really difficult to chase them out of. Um, so, but habitat modification is really the thing that is going to go the farthest for helping keep the rabbits from deciding your yard is the best yard. And if these other combination of things don't work, then exclusion. Um, oftentimes I'll have to tell homeowners that if they can you know, do one push to get all the rabbits out of their yard and in that same time frame, that same day, they can put a close mesh fencing all around the perimeter to keep them from coming back in. This is something that people in a lot of the, you know, closely, um, populated urban areas or suburban areas can do. Um, if you're on property, it's a little less um, realistic. But fencing is a good option. Now, if you're trying to fence off a raised bed, <laughs> and this is a design that I wanted to show you because of the next animals I talk about, and those would be other burrowing animals. For raised beds, when you put them down, on the floor of them, underneath, a quarter inch hardware cloth is really useful. It won't back up any water in there, but animals like rabbits and voles and ground squirrels and you know little chipmunks and all of them, they can't get up through that quarter inch from under the raised bed. Now on the outside of it, here's this design here, which is a fence that has a close mesh that's at least three feet tall. That's because rabbits usually can browse up to about two and a half feet. They, when they stand up on their hind legs, they can reach up pretty tall. So your fence for summer needs to be about three feet high and it has to be buried into the ground a little bit because these are burrowing animals. You can go onto a lot of extension websites and see information where they're talking about what you wanna do is you wanna bury this fencing 18 inches deep and then flare it out 18 inches. That might not be achievable in Colorado with the density of our soils. So if you can get at minimum six to eight inches um, down into the soil, not 18 inches, but you know six to eight, that's usually pretty successful. And then you flare it out um, in a way so that they can't you know, just 
get right under the one lip of the thing, it's too far for them. So you could try that. Um, for these little guys, voles and mice, um, voles, mice and deer all browse on our woody plants. And they, um, they're active all year round. So no hibernation for this animal either. And <clears throat> we have eight different types of voles here in Colorado. And we have mice, <clears throat> pardon me, that'll get into our gardens. And um, they will, because they're active year round, they will feed on the bark of trees and shrubs um, down low to the ground because they have, um, they'll use cover. So tall grasses, shrub, um, scrubby growth, or snow to develop these tunnels under and they'll just run up and they'll tuck up against the side of a tree and they'll just gnaw on some of the uh, thin bark trees um, and they'll end up girdling it and that can be a death blow. Um, you know, I, I do want to go back a little bit. So if there's a little bit of antler rubbing or a little bit of damage to the trunk of the trees from these animals, say the voles, etc., the tree can take a, a bit of damage, but if it goes all the way around the trunk, then that's when the, the um, health of the tree is uh, significantly impacted because it's girdled. So that's what we're talking about. All the way around the trunk, the, the bark has been stripped off and that removes the cambium and uh, its ability, the tree's ability to heal that. So about a third of the way around, um, if the damage is only about a third of the way around, that tree can usually um, seal that over. But, you know, it, it depends on how cold the winter is, available food sources. These animals often will go all the way around and it'll kill your trees and it's a real problem for orchards um, and fruit tree plantings. So what can we do about this? Well, these are tiny animals and they are prey. And so what they are looking for in any of their activities is cover. So we should in late fall, cut grasses and other vegetation around the trees that we're trying to protect pretty short. Um, we're, we're doing that from the trunk of the tree or shrub outwards past two feet so that there is this open area that these voles or mice would have to cross and then sit in in order to do their nudge on the trunk of the tree and they don't like to um, be exposed like that because there are a whole lot of predators that are looking for a meal like this. So cutting down that, um, that habitat near the trees um, then protecting the trees themselves with a physical barrier, if you can do that. And the physical barrier is like this one that I'm showing you here. So this is hardware cloth. Um, it's a quarter inch mesh and it um, is, it, you do sink it into the ground a little bit if the trunk flare will allow it. But the good thing is, is that the uh, circumference of this, the distance from the trunk is at least six inches. So it should be out and past the, the, the trunk flare so that you can sink it into the ground about two inches to prevent these animals from coming up under it. Um, and this you can, you know, leave on uh, year round, but you do have to keep checking to make sure, you know, the tree isn't growing into it. That's always a problem with that. Um, for smaller trees, what you can do is just these little kind of a corrugated or um, concertina-like um, uh, piping that's been slit. So this is a plastic tree guard that you can get for, for these. I know when we're planting a lot of the really young whips in um, orchards, we use this because <clears throat> the rabbits are a real problem on these, these little trees. Thank you for joining us for this short video on how to protect your garden from animals. To find more resources from CSU Extension, visit our Extension website at extension.colostate.edu. Here you can search our publications under the Natural Resources category to find more about wildlife. Here you'll find links to Plant Talk articles, which are short and to the point, 
CSU fact sheets, as well as Master Gardener curriculum. All of these resources are here to help you grow better.